Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Uh, like I have given more than 900 invited talks and this is the first time I'm asked to cover posterior and panduveitis diagnosis, management, laboratory, investigation. Thank you, Dr. Verma, for the very kind I said, how do we approach? How do we... <laughs> <laughs> and absolute pleasure to be presenting in front of Dr. Tityal, Namrata, and the entire panelists. Well, it's not like Sudarshan has said the ball rolling, and the thing he told the most important thing was, if you ask me, Forget your books about uveitis. Don't memorize those long tables. People ask you what are the diseases they cause and then you're rattling out one, two, three. That's not the real life. The real life is actually very simple and very decluttered if you go systematically about it. I'm just going to show you two cases and you just imagine you are sitting in the clinic and they come to you and how would you approach and the things would simply demystify for you. No high-tech investigation, no molecular genetics, nothing. Very simple, basic clinical acumen. So the first thing is, the question is, is the posterior segment involvement only of the posterior segment or is it a part of panduveitis? Now, this is the patient. He is, well, I will call him young now because 55-year-old man, and complaints of bilateral visual loss, recent onset. You look into the retina because you're sitting in the retina clinic and your fellows very excitedly tells you, well, he has these lesions of retinitis all over fundus. He has even got that ultra wide field imaging which shows leakage all over. So it's posterior uveitis, but like Sudarshan said, my fellow missed hypopion because he thought he was sitting in the retina clinic. So he is entitled only to look at the retina. So the patient also has a comparatively quiet looking eye and has bilateral hypopion. You don't have a small pupil or anything, but there is hypopion. So now, the second question, which is very important, you know it's panuveitis, but the question is, is the disease confined only to the eye or is it a part of some systemic disease? So I have omitted all the uveitis clinic files which had a very, very long history and all this. It's not really required. Just talk to the patient as you see the phenotype. Now the patient says, well, he has been having gait disturbances since last one month. Also some skin rash, like Dr. Verma says, are we skin specialists? Well, I'll show you how. He says there has been some perianal nodular swelling and recurrent skin infections, which he wasn't very sure what it was. Well, this is what he had in his hands. This is what he had in his perianal region which was diagnosed as condylometa later subsequently, and now comes what Sudarshan told you to name the disease. So what have you done? You have simply done a slit lamp examination. You have done fluorescein, but even if you had not done to, believe me, it was not really required. So you name the disease, which is the most crucial step in uveitis. Middle-aged adult, bilateral, acute onset hypopion uveitis with retinitis, retinal vasculitis, maculopapular rash, condylometa letter, gait disturbances. I'm sure all of you will agree in the hall. It's syphilis and you don't need any investigations to be done. Why would you check for tuberculosis or this and that and autoimmune and all? Because you have named it and nothing else fits into it other than syphilis of course, HIV, and so you investigate only for this. But since he has neurologic disturbances, you would also require a neuroconsult and MRI, not to make the diagnosis, but for the overall well-being of the patient. Sure enough, the MRI shows the lacunar infarct in the right corona radiator, which is suggestive of obliterative endarthritis and again suggestive of syphilis. 
And here I'm just going to put one point that when you are dealing with uveitis, you are the boss. Don't let any pulmonologist, rheumatologist, or neurologist bully you to tell you what treatment you can give or what you cannot give. You tell them, this is what I want and you better do it. So this is the syphilis because otherwise neurologists thought, oh, well, this was ischemic infarct and no. But when you say it is syphilis, then they turn around and say, oh, yes. So it's a secondary syphilis, HIV positive, needs systemic therapy. So you treat it like a neurosyphilis. And that was my first case. The second case is, again, to show you how the phenotype can evolve over a period of time. So this is a 30-year-old lady who comes with acute visual loss, uh, 2400 vision. There is no segment inflammation either in the vitreous or in the interior segment. So this is purely a posterior uveitis, bilateral disease. There is no systemic disease. The general physical examination is done and that's normal. So if you have to name it, young woman, bilateral, acute onset, you have multiple exudative detachments with patches of choroiditis. There is some disc edema and mostly involving the posterior pole. What is the meshing you will do? VKH tops the list. Some masquerades and others would not come in this age, multifocal, you know, exudative detachment. What investigations would you like to do? OCT. The basilary layer detachment, which uh, like we have described and which you see on the OCT and choroidal thickness. These are the two very typical signs which you will not see in CSC, in pachychoroid or in fact in any other inflammatory condition other than VKH. So you really do not need more than OCT. But of course, we all have tools and we have fun with it. So you do get fluorescein ICG done, which is suggestive of VKH. ICG definitely shows these small round stromal granulomas. So these are the granulomas which you see in VKH and sometimes in sarcoid. There is no other third entity where you would, I mean, the common entity where you would see these kind of granulomas, which are very, very classical. So you do not need investigations. You do not need to test for Lyme, syphilis, this, that. Syphilis, yes, but otherwise no fancy investigation. Just start the patient on treatment, monitor the response to treatment on daily basis. And this is how the patient is responding. In the left eye, you can see the serous detachment going away. The basilary layer detachment is actually the first one to go away, followed by serous detachment, and then the choroid starts coming to normal. And as comprehensive ophthalmologists, please do not write the prescription uh, saying Visalone 50 milligram one week, 40 milligram one week, 30 milligram one week, and that's not how uveitis is. Till the time your lesions are resolved, please do not be in a hurry to taper off the steroid because these autoimmune diseases, if they are allowed to linger on like this, they can be more dangerous than a full-blown disease sometimes. So pay attention to the phenotype before changing the therapy and I'm going to show you the next example in continuity with this. This is a 26-year-old lady who came to us, sudden onset decreased vision. Right eye was looking normal, and again, the pattern is almost same what I showed you in VKH. And sure enough, OCT shows there is a basilary layer detachment and serous detachment in diffuse thickening, but there is also a small PED line there. So we do the fluorescein, the PED is there, but the fluorescein and the ICG subsequently suggestive of VKH with PED. So she receives treatment for VKH. You can see the response. Two weeks later, she comes again with the decreased vision and she was seen by her local ophthalmologist uh, who thought that since the prednisolone was being reduced and this local 
hospital was a big hospital in a big city, they wanted to increase the steroids again, thinking that VKH disease was coming back. Again, look at the pattern. There is no basilary layer detachment. This one is something which is central serous retinopathy, the serous detachment. So just the OCT. So before increasing the systemic steroid, just ask yourself the question, is it CAC or is it the VKH which has come back? Well, does the patient have expanding dot? We do the fluorescein. The fluorescein shows there is an expanding dot. There are the granulomas present, which means the VKH disease is also there. But since the patient has received steroids, he has developed CAC on top of it. So the management would be tapering of the steroid, shifting to immunosuppression, increasing and moving on to biologics, as Dr. Shishir said, if required. So three weeks later, tapering of the steroids and uh, hiking the immunosuppression, you can see the fluid going away. And this is one year later, vision is 6-6. Six, six. And the ICG shows now the disappearance of those granulomas. Three years later, well, to conclude, don't try to memorize all the algorithms and the protocols because that makes uveitis very, very confusing and that's not really the real life. Talk to the patient, examine the patient, talk to yourself actually, that's very important, and the disease will unravel on its own. With this, I would like to thank Ajanta Pharmaceuticals and the entire uh, committee, host committee for having me here. Thank you very much.